architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. Each episode we have a conversation with a contemporary thinker on issues of architecture and architectural thinking. We are trying to advance the frontier of architecture by imagining what it could be in new ways. Today I am talking to Maristella Casciato, who is the Senior Curator for Architecture at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles. Uh, we're going to talk about the research that she has done on the work and life of Pierre Jeanneret, in particular during his time in Chandigarh. Welcome to Architecture Talk, Maristella. Very nice to meet you, Vikram. I'm happy to be here. So I think we should start off by simply uh, thinking about, you know, what attracted you to the life of Pierre Jeanneret and his work? Or not to his, so much to his work. Of course, the work is very important and we know him. But what attracted you to him as a person? Well, I think that this is the most relevant question for me uh, to understand why I finally engaged in my work on Chandigarh and wo all what is related to the founding and then the development of the Punjab capital. I guess that at the very beginning, I was doing some research at the Fondation Le Corbusier and I was attracted by photographs, a series of, of pictures where I saw the two cousins together in a very, very relaxed environment. Basically, they were used to spend some summer holidays, some weeks, I don't really know exactly, in um, on the north of France uh, in a location called Arcachon, where, I mean, on, it's on a beach side. And it was really a place where they could in a way, be completely themselves. There was nothing about the role of the Atelier en Rue de Sèvres or something like this. And those are very, very funny, in a way, uh, photographs. You see the two of them on a boat. You see the two of them uh, making a wrestling. You see the two of them boxing. So uh, I said, I mean, my... My initial uh, curiosity, if I have, I, if I can use this word, it was really about the man and how these two men related to each other. Let's let's talk a little bit more about that. Those early days, you know, before World War Two, when they were work, when they were cousins practicing together, and what is the story behind Charlotte Perriand uh, and uh, and. Uh, their supposed rivalry around her? It's a very good question. Also because, as you call, in the early days, um, the atelier was not overcrowded. There were people working there, of course. I'm talking about the, the late 20s, beginning of the 30s. And there were... I mean, the, the Japanese architects uh, were around uh, uh, Sakakura and Maikawa. Um, and then Charlotte Perian arrives. I never met her. I have to tell you, uh, I, I, I read a lot about her and I have met several people who knew her quite well. I can tell you definitely, and I think this is not my I mean, this is not something I'm making up. She was an extremely intriguing woman, in, very smart, quick to, uh, to connect ideas, uh, eager to learn. Coming from her de de more education in art decorative, she was really ready to, to be more experimental. And I guess that the, the issue of the furniture, the very first um, project they did together, it's very much 
experimenting. You, the, you mean talking about the chairs? Yes, I'm talking about the chairs, long, all the chairs and so on. Because, of course, I mean, you can, you can go through a, a wood chair, of course. There were already experiment in um, carved um, steel chairs. But, I mean, the idea of looking at that, both on the tradition, for instance, of the traditional armchair, the comfort, the grand, as they call them, the grand comfort, and then also introducing new material, a very light looking, for, for her, was really an important component of her approach to both Le Corbusier and Pierre Janaret. Were she and Pierre involved romantically? I guess so. I mean, I know that I guess. This is true, I mean. Right. They were, um, in a way, they were, I guess they were attracted to each other, of course. It's a, it's a matter of fact that she was an extremely attractive woman. Uh, we may say she was a beauty. I mean, she was not only smart, but also beautiful. Both of them, both the two cousins very, were very much attracted by her. Yes, there was a rivalry, sort of. Well, you know, I mean, <laughs> I don't know how much we can talk about. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to be politically correct. I mean, 100%. No, no. I mm. mean, it's human being. It's human being. Um, but, you know, they also had, they also had other other reason to share, I mean, other, I mean, field to share. They were both attracted, I mean, by the countryside. They were extremely good skiers. They loved nature. They were attracted, for instance, both extremely attracted by photography. Now, Kobu has been also a good photographer, but he used the camera in a very different way. I mean, more to look at this building or, or maybe as a way of thinking. I mean, both of them were extremely, extremely skilled as photographer. And, and when Charlotte entered the office, she already had a camera that she received as a, as a gift from her first husband who knew uh, uh, of her passion for photography and and this idea of the camera going around um, this is the whole period where they are interested in how nature becomes part of the environment uh, without romanticizing but you know all this idea of the art brute um, the stone uh, the trees, uh, uh, how, I mean, this becomes also part of a kind of natural artistic environment. Those are years that I think are extremely formative for both of them, but they also form their, I mean, they are sharing mutually, I mean, what they like, and maybe in this sharing, there is also a love, I mean, shared. <laughs> Because of his complex love-hate relationship with Le Corbusier, the Chandigarh project was perfect for Pierre, wasn't it? That he could be at a distance from Le Corbusier, still his representative and executor of projects, and yet at the same time at a place from where he could formulate and develop his own work and identity. And I, and I think about this a lot, because to a certain extent, that same relationship was played out in the relationship that many of the Indian architects had with PJ as well. Mm, yeah, yeah. There was a sort of a mentorship relationship, but also the desire to separate and distance themselves. I know certainly that was the case with my father, where there was a lot of respect and love yet at the same time a desire to have some space for themselves. I agree with your analysis, and I really very much engage with this idea that, in a way, Chandigarh, going beyond the myth that we know about that so many other colleagues have been writing about and so on, I mean, the distance make Pierre to become aware who is he in life? I mean, right. I'm, I'm positive that he was extremely, 
unhappy. And I have read some letters and documents when he finally found out that Charlotte, for very, very important reason, she had decided to marry someone because she was really in danger. So this is, we don't want to get into that. And I, I guess that finally he can't, I mean, he understands, he has to accept the situation, but in a way, going to Chandiga was also a place to, to find another nature for himself. Some, something that would help in a way also to heal if you want to go into this, but it's not necessary, but probably to find himself in the situation where he could really be the, the one who would com- construct, complete, be the uh, the work of, of his cousin and some other of the people, but he would also be able to e- express himself. He definitely needed that at the end of the 40s. If that was true, then who did PJ become in Chandigarh? Um, Pierre was extremely skilled in... Um, let's say, in fields that are very much related to architecture, but have to do with invention, with being creative, with looking at a a technique or a material from the creative point of view. All this was his contribution always in the atelier in Paris. When he, when he finds himself in in Chandigarh, Vikram, don't you think that the fact that, of course, is the one who, make, who needs to make sure that the capital will be built under certain technological challenging and so on. But he also finds himself so much, uh, have so much freedom in saying, okay, let me, I mean, let me invent, for instance, with a very simple technique like a brick. Right. Let me invent. Uh, or let me build, for instance, housing. You know, he comes from the the period where housing at the office in Paris was basically the white villas. Um, I don't want to know that he didn't like or he liked it. I mean, he was very much in charge of that. But what is very important, here he has the possibility to express himself, to work with something that... It's very creative. Here he has the brick. He can work on different texture. He can work with the people. He makes himself so relevant to so many young Indian architects, but also the people who live in Chandigarh. I think he was a very popular figure in Chandigarh. People knew him. He was, you know, he was not someone who was the architect on a kind of aura somewhere. He was really working with what was his natural inclination. And I think that this freedom made him becoming a different man, a man believing in himself. He was really, without too much of a rhetoric, he was really, and I believe in this, a man of very simple things, When I think about his life, I mean, in some ways, I relate very closely to PJ because, you know, of course, he went back to Geneva at the end. But at the same time, he asked for his ashes to be carefully dispersed in Sukhna Lake in Chandigarh, you know, which is a sort of a very significant gesture. Yeah, absolutely. He felt very close, uh, obviously, to Chandigarh and its ethos. And the idea of putting ashes into water is a very Indian Hindu thing. I don't think it's a, you know, Swiss Calvinist uh, thing. Oh, no. Oh, no. (laughs) I don't know how you feel about this. You know, I live in the United States and I have a kind of a dual uh, loyalty to India and to the U.S. And in certain way, I suppose, to to other places as well. But I think he probably had that similar duality to him, unlike somebody like Le Corbusier, who is, you know, correctly described as a global architect who used his Paris centrality to, uh, to look over the world. Whereas Pierre belonged, I think, uh, significantly to at least a couple of places. 
I agree, I agree, totally agree with you. I mean, though Le Corbusier developed, and that's also interesting, an extremely uh, strong relationship, not very much to India, but to the idea of the city, there was more than just being the architect of the, uh, the Punjab capital. On the other side, I, I think that Pierre needed a place like Chandigarh. As we say, he could really find himself as a human being in the, in the, in the, in the place where, I mean, he, f- he felt not only loyal uh, to, uh, to the work that he was doing, but to the people, but also to the idea, to the idea of the post-colonial India, mm-hmm. to the idea of a, a, a capital of a, of the specific region, uh, the partition. So he felt that very, very strong. And he was able to communicate that because, I mean, your father was in the architect's office. We talked many times to the few, I mean, that are still have been still around from Jit Malhotra to Sharma and, uh, and um, all of them recognized that they could always talk to Pierre. Yes, yes. That all, Pierre was always, the, the house, I mean, had always an open door. This is maybe very, very Indian, but you know, for a European who comes, I mean, from a certain also quote unquote elitarian, uh, bourgeois environment, uh, from Switzerland, this is something that it's, Either you endorse this and you fully trust and you fully understand, or you are not capable to to change yourself. So it, this is really relevant. This is really, re- and you know how much he loved the, the Suk- Sukna Lake. I mean, you know, at a certain moment he built this very funny pedalo because he loved the water and he. In a way, quote unquote, he was missing the lake. I mean, the, <laughs> the Geneva so, lake. So here he has a yeah. lake, and he builds in the in the garden of his house this very funny <laughs> object that, of course, couldn't go that far. But it was fun to go. I mean, and um, and use it. I mean, on the lake to have fun and going around. And I'm sure that many people saw it, many people use it. Uh, and you remember, I mean, even the famous engineering, what is, I don't recall the name. P.L. Barman. Yes. Even he was going uh, with him. I mean, it's like a ritual because he loved it. I mean, the, the lake, the water. But I also think he was missing something of that. Right, right. No, you know, like what you were saying earlier, I remember reading in my father's uh, articles that as far as he was concerned, that if PJ hadn't been in Chandigarh, Kabuse would have had a fight and uh, left uh, long ago and that uh, most of the projects would not have got done. He describes Pierre as a kind of a glue yeah, and more than a glue, sort of, he describes him as a kind of very quiet and unassuming facilitator who resolved conflict again and again, not only between Cabousier and the engineers and the administrators, but also between the Indian architects and the engineers and the administrators. He was kind of the passe partout or sort of the mediator on all sides. Mm. And I think this sort of having this open door policy, open door ethic rather, open door culture, yeah. uh, which is again a very sort of Chandigarh Indianish thing, was key to that. I fully agree with that. And we sometimes, um, also, the, we know, I mean, that nothing was really idyllic in Chandigarh, even in the architect's office. We have read now uh, about conflicts, about, I mean, people being competitive. Uh, people are, I mean, we know in the field of architecture, they have their own agenda. And, you know, I think that he was, as you say, the glue. But 
it is it was a kind of of natural for him behavior because you know it was so fun when I found in the archive he tried and tried with the architects to learn for instance some um, indie words how to say a few things and he so did. on <laughs> uh, because you know one thing. Uh, Pierre was not skilled when well lang- with well languages. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, I'm fully admire of someone whose personality is so much outgoing, is so much based on generosity that even if you don't completely speak the language, you are capable to transmit the message. You are capable to forward your ideas. And and probably the other one, they were both, I mean, fascinated, but on the other side, they truly understood that he was totally sin- sincere, that there was n- any time something who could have been masked or, or a second agenda. But of course, I, I have read a few letters in the archive. There are some architects who are giving him very hard time. Not at the very beginning, not the first years, you know. It's more the um, the urge to build, to begin, that becomes a glue. But when things started to be settled, this is around 57, 8, and so on, uh, you know, people start complaining. He, he wants to be the head of that. Um, it, it, it's always conflictual in architecture because you deal with the ideas, but you also deal with the, the fact that you build. You can see something becomes real. Right. And at a certain moment also, don't forget, uh, Vikram, that uh, Max Fry, who played at the beginning a major role, and as is gone, I mean, they are both gone in between the uh, in fifty four. So he is there. He has to deal with the conflict, with the administration, teaching the architect, building the city, and does it with an incredible generosity. Uh, probably that's that's his major asset there. That'll be a good time to take a quick break. We are talking to Minister Lacasciato about the life and work of Pierre Genere. We are back. We are talking to Marista Lacasciato, and we are discussing what Pierre Genere did once he was in Chandigarh. So let's talk a little bit more about you know his his re- local relationships. Yes, and and we all know that he, along with Le Corbusier, had a great fondness for A. R. Prabhavalkar. Yes, who was who yes. was a fine fine architect, and I must admit that I. I never, I mean, I must have met him as a small uh, kid, but I, I, whereas, whereas I have very clear and distinct memories of most of the other Indian architects on the team, I don't have any real memory of him. And mm-hmm. I was, in fact, asking my mother yesterday about him getting ready for our conversation today, and, and I collected some things from her. But anyway, from your reading and research, you know, do you know why Prabhavalkar was so loved and and kind of uh, favorited by PJ? I have to to say it very uh, frankly that there is, as you know, very limited literature. What really strikes me that um, in, I mean, Prabhupada was very much involved specifically um, in the uh, capital complex. Right. Uh, so basically, uh, Le Corbusier, and, and that's the, the project that Le Corbusier really cares, uh, I mean, for, because he understands very well that what will be built there, no matter what we think it now, will remain something exceptional. And so, um, when he, when they met in Chandigarh, he, 
totally know that Pierre will be capable to handle the project in terms of construction, but uh, he needed someone who can handle very properly in the end uh, the workers, you know, the building company, and so on. So uh, Pierre would not be able to do that because for various reasons, he had many other projects, but also he was not Indian. So, you know, it's not easy to pour all that uh, cement or to work in such a certain condition, very different from Europe, no matter how good you are. So he, he, I think that probably car was probably extremely good in uh, technically very equipped, very skilled, and also capable to transfer ideas that were sometimes difficult to explain to the workers, but I mean, to transfer uh, those ideas to the people who were on the building side. So by the end, he was, uh, let's say, the condition sine qua non, Some, nothing else could have been done without him. And, uh, and in a way, he, and in a certain reflexive way, because Le Corbusier, trusts him so much, I mean, he becomes like a, 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 a Toto with the, the, I mean, Pierre, him, and Corbu in the building of the, the capital complex. That's all I can, it's amazing that how many letters Corbu is sends to, I mean, to Pierre, but always also, if it's about the capital, Rabawakar is always there. Even when he wants to publish, for instance, images in the oeuvre complete, um, he doesn't refer to, to Pierre because he thinks Pierre is too busy, Pierre is not answering, and so on. So he sends him a letter and say, please do that and that, please go to Pierre and ask for that and that. So he is the one that becomes the his um, ambassador uh, for completing the project. Right, right. I think, yeah, that's right. I think that's exactly right. Prabhavalkar became Kabuzia's man, a uh, local man, really, on, on, on the site. I think that's true. And, and, and in a way, that worked well also for Pierre, in a way, because, as I say, Pierre needed people skilled as he was, but he was also needed someone who could transfer to a different group of people. Um, no matter how, how, how good you know what is a reinforced concrete, but to, uh, to do the spray of gunite, all that, he needed someone who could really understand and be then there on the building side and say, we do this and this and this. Sometimes we lose the memory of how complex that building site was at the That's time. true. Okay, so as we move towards the end here, let's talk a little bit about PJ's famous furniture and its its contemporary, uh, let's say, reevaluation in the art market. Hmm. Of course, uh, this furniture, which was built very locally with the Indian craftsmen, yeah, uh, and built in mass quantities for use in the all over the city is now sold for I don't know fifty thousand, hundred thousand more yeah. per piece in the in the art market. Uh, what is your thinking about this unexpected trajectory of the furniture? I don't know who started all that. We know for sure that. Few people understood very well that could have been a market and started when no one really paid attention. And then people uh, in some of the one family house, they started, I mean, not to like them any longer because they thought, well, what's this? Uh, I prefer something else, <laughs> maybe more um, decorative and so on. And so they probably sold them, but for nothing. 
Um, and then they inv invaded the market. You know, in a way that it was not unknown in the U.S., because this is specifically a US, more a U.S. phenomenon. It was not unknown. Around 47, 48, Pierre spent almost a year in the U.S., and he worked for Knoll. Mm -hmm, right. And he designed several furniture for Knoll, and specific those that are called the scissor chairs that are then, in my opinion, really the base for some of his Chandigarh furniture is referring to them. So in the American market, Knoll uh, is very important. So there is also some, I mean, this is my opinion. I never really worked on that. I was only infuriated when they started this. <laughs> but, right. I mean, I think that he's, it was not unknown. And in the beginning, the market could also, I mean, use the fact that he had been designing for an important um, furniture maker in this country. Now, this, you see, those are also fashion waves, I mean, in my opinion. Now, it's very hard to go back. Uh, I recently saw uh, two chairs who were not at all restored. They were probably coming uh, from uh, a simple house, nothing really special. They were not all clean. They were without upholstery. They still have the number, the code number, and so on. And they basically went on auction for an outrageous price, in my opinion. But they will be restored. They will be uh, become shiny and perfect. And the next step will be one of this figure that you mentioned. I mean, I mean, forty thousand, fifty thousand dollars. I, I one once I was in Chandigarh and I was talking to people high in the administration, and they say, "Oh, we should sue those people," and and I say, "It's it's totally useless. It's not your fault. It's something that happened." Um, market uh, in this field can be extremely voracious, can be aggressive. And no matter how much we feel unhappy, I don't think that you can stop this. But on the other side, not long ago, Vikram, to say you the truth, and I can tell you where, I went to visit the public library, Sector 17, so you know what it is. Yeah, it's yeah. the public library, sector 70. It has a beautiful ramp, in my opinion, and so on. At a certain moment, they left me alone, and I went out. The There are balconies, I mean, around. And I went out um, just to see, I mean, the, the sector 17 from a higher level. And it was full of furniture. Right. It was full of furniture that were thrown away because some of them were bra broken, some of them were probably not the most comfortable, and so on. And my only question was, where are they going to... What will happen? The day that a truck comes and they will be... I mean, there's... Uh, um, what's going to happen? <laughs> Someone probably can throw them away and someone can take advantage. I have no clue. I mean, so, I mean, it's not the fault of the administration, but there has been probably a sort of naivete or not really respect for this work. And not everything could be, uh, the conservation cannot be a, a project for everything, but maybe a better attention would have been relevant. So, finally, well, Marista, Chandigarh is now uh, over 60 years old, 65, 66 years old. Yeah. And it's very inhabited. You go to India, as we can again see in the photographs in in the book that you and uh, Tom Avamath did. Uh, it's very uh, lived in with the street vendors, the inbuilt windows, uh, the sort of uh, adaptation 
by the Indian market, the informal sector, and generally by the Indian uh, culture and ethos. When I grew up in Chandigarh, you know, that's what an Indian city looked like to me. You are very invested deeply in the preservation of the modernist legacy. So when you first visited and when you visit Chandigarh and you see this very inhabited modern city, how do you feel? Do you feel happy to see it like that? Or do you feel strange or do you feel disappointed? I have to say very frankly, I feel happy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel happy because, not because I don't recognize uh, the, the many changes, which sometimes are brutal. But I think that there is one thing in Chandigarh that I really appreciate that by the end, no matter who was the planner or the architect, I think it's really a collective work, but it was a strong work, uh, uh, Vikram. It was a strong work, incredibly strong planning. You know, it will remain, no matter how much they will change, this, I mean, because we have the evidence after 60 years, they could have, uh, I mean, change it completely if it was not strong. I, I'm, I don't think that I'm the only one who still recognize, um, the significance, the pattern. I want to give you a totally different example. One of the most clear example of a Renaissance city is Pienza near Siena. Yes. I mean, and Pienza is in a way the ideal city of the Renaissance. And I, I would compare Pienza, a place I have been thousands of towns have been thousands. And now I hate all this merchandise on the main axis and so on. But when I go, I immediately recognize the scale of the building, the, the pattern of the planning, the scale of the main, main square. I mean, I think that by the end, architecture can be stronger than some of this adjustment and so on. That's why... I mean, I'm never desperate in Chandigarh, but not because I love Chandigarh. I see that the people can live there and they can live being Indian, not being strangers, because that could be the other side of the coin, that you build a monument that totally people will not be able to embody. And this has not been the case in Chandigarh. I think that by the end... It became an Indian city with the pro and cons, the things we love and the other we think, oh, come on, you shouldn't do that. I don't know what is your feeling, but I, I think this is because, as you say, the culture that has been behind the, 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 the building of Chandigarh has been strong and also the way the, the all the architects, not only Corbu and Pierre, because even more, I, more when I see what's happening now, I see that this is a city that is the result of an incredible work of many. It's not the work of one; it's the work of many, and the work of many lasts. I mean, long. Well, Maristella, it has been a, such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for being on Architecture Talk. Thank you, and uh, I really enjoyed it, Vikram. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is Vikram Prakash, and our show's producer is Sadie Wechsler. Architecture Talk is available on iTunes, on Spotify, and numerous other platforms that carry podcasts. If you enjoyed listening to Architecture Talk, please do remember to subscribe and to rate us on iTunes. See you next time.